um, thank you for joining us uh, today for our panel discussion, COVID Communications Did Science Win, which is being held as part of the Cambridge Festival. Uh, my name is Rob Reddick. I am a COVID editor at The Conversation, uh, an online magazine. Um, and what I've noticed over the last two years is that it's not just the virus that's been spreading across the UK, but information about it as well, um, almost as rapidly and comprehensively. Um, the amount of time devoted to scientific topics has exploded with the arrival of COVID. Um, it's changed how science has been talked about, um, and we've seen disease-related information broadcast at times daily into our homes from the heart of government, with scientific advisors standing shoulder to shoulder with the Prime Minister. Um, science communication has played a key role, and that's you know, online, on TV, in public, on posters, in billboards, uh, in getting people to change their behaviours. Um, comms campaigns have instructed us to wear masks, to uh, get tested, to stay at home and protect our loved ones as necessary, um, and to take vaccines. COVID communications has underpinned pretty much every pillar of the country's pandemic response. But was it done well enough? Did science communication reach everyone it needed to? Did public discussions keep people accurately informed about the virus and the state of the pandemic? Was enough done to stop the spread of misinformation about COVID? To consider these questions and more, um, we're joined today by a panel of experts. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Chris Smith, who's a medical consultant specialising in cl clinical microbiology and virology at the University of Cambridge and Adam Brooks Teaching Hospital. Chris founded the Naked Scientist radio show, podcast and website in 1999. He's currently a co-presenter of the show. Uh, you may also have heard him on one of his regular slots during the pandemic on BBC Radio 5 Live, or seen him answering uh, viewers' COVID questions on BBC Breakfast News. Chris is going to talk to us about his experiences of doing public engagement during the pandemic. We're also joined by Dr. John Kerr, who is a social psychologist at the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence at the University of Cambridge, as well as a member of the Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab. John's research interests include beliefs about debated scientific issues, political attitudes, and the communication of scientific information to non-experts. Outside of research, he has also worked in publishing and communications roles in the UK and New Zealand, most recently as a senior media advisor at the Science Media Centre of New Zealand. John will speak about working on uh, COVID communication guidelines with the Cabinet Office, uh, and also his work on communicating risk and on addressing misinformation. Finally, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Uh, Tushna Vandravala, who is Professor of Health Psychology at Kingston University and St. George's University of London. Her research interests include health inequalities in underserved groups, so that's ethnically diverse groups, migrant groups, and undocumented migrants. And her expertise lies in conducting applied health research and developing and evaluating outreach educational interventions with real-world relevance. She is a participant uh, in the Independent Scientific Pandemic Insights Group on Behaviours, uh, or SPI-B, which is a subgroup of SAGE, uh, the Government uh, Scientific Advisory Panel. Tushna is going to speak about her work on health communications with ethnically diverse groups during the pandemic, uh, the rise of conspiracy theories, and how COVID has put a spotlight on social inequalities. So we're going to hear from each of our panellists in turn. Um, we're then going to discuss a bit more broadly uh, whether science communications won during the pandemic, as well as take some questions uh, from you in the audience. So um, please do have these ready um, for the second half of the session. Um, for those of you here in the theatre, we'll have someone come around with a microphone um, and you can ask directly to the panel. Um, and for those of you at home, um, you can submit them uh, via Slido. Um, but I think that's probably enough from me. So I'd like to hand over to Chris, please. You're right. <laughs> Evening. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not naked. <laughs> Anyone disappointed? I'll tell you what, you'd be a lot more disappointed if I was actually naked. But. It's April the 1st. There are about one in 10 people in the population right now who are COVID positive. There's about 100 and something people in here. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> hands up who's got a virus at the moment. No hands. Really interesting. When I asked that question about two, three years ago, Adam Brooks, uh, just for a seminar one evening, you can normally expect about 30% of the population at any one time is virus positive with something. And so you get about 30% of the people put their hands up. And it's really funny. Now, suddenly, who here is now frightened to cough in public? 
because everyone suddenly looks at you and you kind of th you duck for cover, don't you? It's become the, the non-thing to do. But you should all have your hands up, actually, because I guarantee every single one of you is riddled with viruses right now. Who's got herpes? <laughs> right, one honest person and 99% liars. Because everybody in this room's got herpes. Because the family of viruses that are herpes viruses, they are actually millions of years old. Dinosaurs had herpes. Do you know what the dinosaur herpes virus was called? Cold saurus. Uh, no, no, they really are millions of years old. And they've now diversified into this big family of viruses. And who's had chicken pox? That's a herpes virus. Now we're talking, right. Who's got cold sores? That's a herpes virus, and 80% of you have got that in you right now in your nervous system. Who's had glandular fever? 90% of you should have your hands up. It's the kissing disease. Most people catch it between the ages of 6 and 14. Can't think why. <laughs> Cytomegalovirus, that's a herpes virus. There's loads of them. And once you've got one of these herpes viruses, it lives in you forever. It's in your nervous system or in other cells in your body, and it stays with you for life. And actually, everyone thinks viruses are bad, but they're really good under certain circumstances, because if you've got viruses like the dinosaur herpes viruses, it depends on you being well to ferry it round for the rest of your life and give it to other people. So if you die, it dies. So it's got a vested interest actually in keeping you healthy. So there is good evidence that you catch some of these viruses and you're better off at fighting off other ones, like plague and listeria, other diseases. So don't diss viruses Sometimes they're actually quite useful. But this coronavirus is not so useful. And, it, you know, two years ago, I remember I was on a train coming back from London, and I'd, it was the, actually, I'd only been to London once since then, because I got called down there and they said, Will you come on Radio 4 and talk about this virus? Because no one seems to know anything about what's going on and it's getting a bit, bit tense. And so I went down there, I expected to do this little interview. Next thing I know, they've devoted the entire program to coronavirus, and it's me and Evan Davis doing it. And I thought, wow, you know, this is... I've been making programmes, radio programmes, for about 20 years. And, you know, slowly I've, I've kind of, I think, got a bit better over time. But I'd never done anything quite like this. And it has taught me a huge amount in the last two years about communicating things clearly. I've done it on television, I've done it on radio, and we've done it as a podcast. And what it's taught me is actually not just how to read a science paper and then report on it, it's taught me about considering all of the different elements of a story, such as the political elements, and how this impacts on different sectors of society, and how different groups of people react to things in different ways, and how to get the message across to people in different ways that, that are tailor-made to them. And, and it's been really educative for me, but at the same time, it's been a wonderful opportunity. Because as someone said to me once, you know, um, there's no such thing as luck. Luck is when opportunity meets preparation. And so I think I was very lucky to come to this as someone who knew a bit about broadcasting and knew a bit about virology, viruses, and, and could then use both to, to try to make this interesting and accessible for people. And I, and I think the broadcasters have actually done very well because I think they recognised early on that it wasn't going to cut it if we just had talking heads, people who would just spout information that they'd read somewhere. You needed the real deal and they needed to, to have trust in people who actually knew what they were talking about and then give them the opportunity to do that. And many, many broadcast platforms all around the world have, have worked with, with me and, and the team at The Naked Scientist now. And uh, we, we've been very lucky, I think, to have had their confidence. People like the, the team at BBC Breakfast on the television and at Radio 4 and Radio 5 Live to, to actually reach very large audiences, I think, with very clear information. But, you know, I've never done anything quite like going on the news channel and them saying, well, it's going to be any question on anything for the next 20 minutes. You think, crikey. And, um, and actually, it went OK. So if anyone's got any questions at the end of this, <laughs> get your thinking caps on. Thank you. Gosh, that's a tough act to follow. Um, 
obviously don't have the naked scientist uh, spiel or the experience with BBC, but I will try my best. And I think I may stand up because I'm using some slides. Okay, so during the pandemic, um, my team did work looking at how ethnic minority groups made sense of COVID and really trying to think about how they responded to testing vaccine uptake relating to COVID. And it was quite early in the pandemic um, that pictures like this hit the news and the news that uh, ethnic communities were disproportionately represented uh, both in terms of incidents and deaths came early in the pandemic and the news coverage of ethnic communities continued. News such as black people and other diverse groups uh, not taking the jab continued to hit the media. Our work showed that there were various conspiratorial beliefs that existed among some ethnically diverse uh, groups. And this, you know, some of which was very much present in uh, the general population as well. Oh, COVID's not very, is not serious. It's the flu. Uh, it's not serious, it's not real. Other conspiratorial beliefs that um, it's a way of controlling part of the population while others were much more specific to the ethnic communities. It's a way that it intentionally harms their communities. If people go into hospital, the, the virus wouldn't kill them, but it would be intentionally, other the services would intentionally kill them. And vaccines harm certain communities. And these were conspiratorial beliefs that were very prevalent in some ethnic communities. And our work really looked at messaging, public messaging, government messaging, and how it positioned people from ethnic communities as outsiders. Many of them didn't see themselves represented in the messaging. Stay at home messaging. We know, just thinking back to the media representations of the bus driver, the cab drivers, who were getting COVID and dying of COVID, their lives were not represented with the government messaging and that was really important they didn't see themselves represented science is often not part of their world view when we spoke to people they said the relevance of science is not part of the way they see the world their world view in a pandemic, messages change, um, but that was confusing to people who perhaps were not science literate, and that is really important to acknowledge. But most of all, the, the messages were not culturally represented, and that was important. It didn't reflect on their economic conditions or pe precarity, losing jobs, the health inequalities that already exist in these communities. And this really made them feel, and I know Chris talked about that trust being so important and that mistrust in institutions, mistrust in government was already in existence and in some ways got exacerbated during COVID for some groups and some people from ethnic communities. That mistrust in not only the media, which they felt were blaming them, but government and other institutions. And when we really think about how COVID and people understand, from diverse groups really understood that messaging, we've got to think about the wider context, the wider context of historical racism, historical mistrust that does exist, um, the past misgivings of vaccine hesitancy and, vac and the reasons for not wanting to take the, the, the vaccine were very prevalent in their minds. Contemporary awareness, contemporary events such as Black Lives Matter, again, was really pertinent. And for many people, that really made them feel very unwelcome, but also got the issues of global inequity uh, in a public forum. COVID for many exacerbated their plight, and this was really important to consider. So I'll just leave you with that last slide. And I know it, sounds, it looks quite academic, but really, I, you know, to try and showcase how this perhaps works. And when we think about why is it that some communities 
have conspiratorial beliefs or denial beliefs and therefore don't take the vaccine or don't test. And testing, you know, of course, we don't have testing anymore. But for future pandemics, these issues will be relevant. We've got to think of it as a disruption caused by COVID. We have to always think about the context in which we are looking at this issue. Historical misgivings are important. We have to consider them, but we also have to think about the contemporary issues. That messaging, for those that felt that the messaging aligned with their life, that top, bottom, the, the high representation, they felt it was relevant, they went on to think, yes, of course, this makes sense to me. Their sense making was receptive and therefore took the vaccine, decided to test. However, for others where they felt that that messaging wasn't relevant to them, wasn't important to them, they then go through conspiratorial beliefs, that denial, and therefore you perhaps don't think testing and vaccine is relevant. So just, you know, I think as we in the media, academics, policy makers talk about th ways in which we encourage people to go in for vaccines, it's acknowledging the context and the messaging and making sure we get that right. Thank you. So, hi everyone, uh, my name's John. I'm actually here as a stand-in for Sander van der Linden. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna do my best to fill his enormous shoes, but I, that's a metaphor. Uh, he, he has very normal-sized feet. Um, but I'm a social psychologist. I work at a place called the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication, which has a very good name because it explains exactly what we look at, which is the communication of risk and evidence. And uh, we're a team of social psychologists, uh, cognitive psychologists and statisticians who think about the ways that we interpret numbers and evidence in everyday life. Um, and I started in this job uh, in Ma uh, March 2020, so exactly one pandemic ago. Um, and it was an awkward time to be traveling around the world. I came from New Zealand. But um, over the last two years, I've been working with the team and we've been looking at how we think about risk, the numbers that we see in the news, but also how experts communicate risk and talk about these numbers. And I thought just to start off today, I'd talk about um, some work that we've been doing with the Cabinet Office, looking at a set of guidelines or recommendations for talking about evidence, particularly around decisions we need to make, like should I get a vaccine, for instance. Um, and so it's... It's five kind of key points that we've settled on, and, and you can Google this. You can, if you look up five rules for evidence communication, uh, you can find an article that my colleagues wrote in the journal Nature that really lays out a bit more background. And I'm going to go through them really quickly, and then maybe some more of it will come up in the discussions. But um, when the Cabinet Office expressed some interest in this, uh, the first thing they did, being a government department, was to give it an acronym. Uh, so it's called PROVE, P-R-O-V-E and I'll go through them quickly. Uh, so the P, prove and prove, is for pre-bunking. And that's an idea of trying to get out ahead of misunderstandings, misinformation, and actually warn people about it beforehand. So rather than trying to correct misinformation after the fact, you're actually trying to get out ahead of it, which is tricky, and we might talk about some ways of doing that in the discussion. The second one, R, stands for reliably inform which is really a, a recommendation that you should focus on informing people rather than trying to persuade them. And that's a controversial point. You know, there's some contention there. There are times when maybe you do want to shift people's behavior in a specific direction. But if you're trying to inform people, you're really trying to give them an impartial account of the evidence, which leads to the third one, O, which is offer balance. You know, be clear about the, the harms and the benefits. Don't just focus on one or the other, but try and give a balanced account of both sides. And that doesn't mean like false balance, not equivocal. You want to give due weight to where the evidence sits, but you also want to be clear about it, that there are two sides to things. The fourth V is for verify quality, which just means to be clear about the quality of the evidence that you're basing your claims on. And, you know, we can think about evidence in terms of scientific research. It might have been done in a different country or it might have been done several years ago. Or maybe it's not quite the, the right study design to address a particular issue. And we just need to be clear about that 
If there isn't good evidence, but it's the only evidence, we still just need to be clear that it may be not be the best evidence that, that could exist, but it's what we have. And the last one, E, is explain uncertainties. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that there are uncertainties. So this could be the uncertainties around specific numbers. I mean, if you think about the R number, this is a really good example. If you look up the R number at the moment, you don't find the R number. You find a range on the government website. It says the R number is, I think, at the moment between 1.0 and 1.2. I'm not sure. But it's always expressed as a range. And that communicates uncertainty. It says we're not exactly sure what the R number is but it's somewhere between these two points. And in fact, they say, we don't know what it is right now. This is based on data that came in in the last few weeks. So there's even more uncertainty there. But that's the final point, is to try and be clear about those uncertainties. So we've been doing a little bit of work trying to you know, refine these guidelines. And one of the things that I've been working on recently is, is actually testing them. So getting people to read different forms of information that do or don't follow those guidelines and seeing what impact it has on their perceptions of the information. And one thing we've been finding is that, particularly amongst people with kind of negative or, or even neutral beliefs about a particular issue, taking this you know, informing, balanced approach is actually, it's actually perceived as more trustworthy, that people put more credibility in the information when they, when they see that it's being impartial and attempting to inform rather than persuade. So I'm, I can probably go into some more of those points in the discussion, but I thought I'd, I'd start off with that as an example of the kind of work we've been doing. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we've talked a bit about things that perhaps haven't gone so well and, and things that we might do in the future differently. But I was wondering if we could start by considering what actually did go well you know, during the pandemic. I mean, presumably there were some points where you know, communicators got it spot on. Um, what do you think? Well, I was one of the first people to turn around on the radio and say, everyone is going to catch this thing. And they wanted to kill me. They wanted to lynch me. The audience wanted to lynch me. We we're spending a fortune on locking the country up and telling people to stay at home. And this guy's on the radio telling everyone they're going to catch this thing. What's going on? And actually, uh, it, was, it, was, it was right. I mean, that, that is the fact. We are, we are all going to catch this. Um, we, we estimate that about 50% of our country have had the infection so far, and it, it will go towards 100%. But the difference is we've totally changed the game. And two years ago, the mortality rate in some groups was as high as 10%. I now routinely see the very same people who would have had a 10% mortality rate now have a mortality rate lower than me. Uh, you know, they don't even have any symptoms. <laughs> they catch it, and that's thanks to vaccines. I'm going to have it in a minute because of it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, but I think where, where I think it's gone really well is that actually I think broadcasters recognise that there was huge uncertainty and there was enormous fear in people, a fear of largely the unknown. And how you disabuse people of fear is by giving them information, clear information and reli reliable information, exactly what you're saying, John, reliable information. And, uh, and I think the fact that they found quite quickly a pool of people who were quite good at talking about it, answering questions, and answering questions in a way that was direct and didn't sound uncertain. It, I think it gave people reassurance, and that, I think, went, went well. The other things that have gone well across the whole thing, not just communication, but the whole business about the vaccines, and that was a complete and utter turnaround. And, and people initially were very sceptical and said, that, that's not going to happen, you're not going to make a vaccine that normally costs 10 billion, takes 10 years, you're not going to do that in 10 months. And, and they did, and they didn't just do it once, they had 10 vaccines by the end of that time. So I think that was a positive opportunity to communicate positively about science. And I think, uh, you know, I spoke to David Willits when, because he used to be science minister, and we had him on a programme we made about it. And he said, you know, this has really focused people's attentions on science and on universities and the value of science in society, this whole thing. And, and I think it's done an enormous amount to show people how powerful science is. So I think that's, that's a real positive message in my view. I think even with the ethnic communities, um, there were things that were done that really worked well. Yes, and science, you know, for some people didn't feature high, but the government did invest a huge amount in the co community champion scheme, for example, found ways in which they communicated to people in language they understood. 
found people that that they trusted and i think trust is so important to find trusted reliable credible sources of information and i think in some ways that was done incredibly well and it continues to be a challenge um, i think if we think about the government message that broad brush you know the different slogans that were used protect the nhs etc Yes, the NHS is is an institution that's you know we we care for deeply, but I think that in in some cases where people have that distrust and mistrust of an institution such as the NHS that may not have treated them fairly, those messaging perhaps could have been done differently. So for me, it is uh, my view is that that messaging needs to be when you think about messaging it has to you have to think about the context in which it operates who the person is and it needs to come from a source that's trusted i, I saw one quite funny cartoon you know those things that said stay home protect the nhs and all that and someone had made one when when they realized that there were lots of people going without wages someone came up with a cartoon one it said catch the virus get 200 quid by a PlayStation. <laughs> John, do you yeah. have to I mean, yeah, yeah I've, I've got my microphone here. Uh, there's lots of examples of things that went well and bad, but I can give you a very um, certified example of good communication, which is, um, comes from the Winton Centre where I work in collaboration with the Science Media Centre and uh, an organisation called Sense About Science. We actually put together a prize for good communication of evidence called the Harding Prize. And the winner of that was the Office of National Statistics COVID Infection Survey, which is a huge representative uh, survey of testing regularly of people to see what is the actual level of COVID um, in, in the UK. And it's great data, it's incredibly good quality data and it's incredible research, but the way they communicated that throughout most of the pandemic was really good. They have a very clear website and it became a resource for, for just about every media organisation in the country that they could go there and see the latest statistics as they were coming in without any sort of government messaging or politics attached to it. It was an, an independent sort of stream of communication that was really focused on just laying out what we know about the pandemic based on this data coming in. And I think that was a really good example and it, it won the prize that, that we'd, we'd put up. So um, it was one of the best, in our opinion, examples. Um, but the worst? What was the worst? Well, so we, we actually decided against having a, uh, a kind of booby prize because we didn't want to highlight examples of bad <laughs> communication. But the other thing was it would be quite hard to choose because yeah. oh. <laughs> there are plenty of uh, contenders. Yeah. Um, Tushni, you mentioned uh, the problem of people believing in conspiracy theories. Do you think more could have been done to kind of stop misinformation at source? Um, the infodemic, if we're talking about pandemics, the infodemic pandemic is very, very relevant and continues to be. And I think, yes, and a lot of the information that's spread on conspiracy theories happens in social media. Uh, some of it outside our control. This is where it's spread from abroad. And when we're looking at ethnically diverse group, we knew it was coming from there home countries on WhatsApp and social media and TikTok and all the other different devices that the, the sources that are used. I think we do have to have a strategy and I know the WHO, for example, have invested quite a lot in trying to think about the issues of misinformation and the pandemic. But I think we've got to think about how the sources in which people find this information and try and think about combat, combating it there, that it can't happen in, in any other platform. And John, do you think with those five steps, are you, are you hoping that people potentially are going to be more resilient to sort of picking up on that misinformation? They'll be better at batting it off. Is that, is that the idea? I, I, well, it, from the five steps were, were really from the communicator's perspective. But that element of pre-bunking, the, the first point, is really about, as a communicator or an organisation, thinking about potentially what misinformation is already out there, um, or, or, or ways that this, what you're saying could be misconstrued. 
and trying to preempt that. Because often people might think, of, it's all clear to me, I'm just going to go up and say it, and not realise how people may interpret, misinterpret it, or not realise what other kinds of misinformation or conspiracy theories are circulating, that people will go, oh, well, you're saying one thing, but I've heard another. And if you're able to address that in, in talking to people or an audience, then it, it gives you an edge ahead of, of that misinformation. But, I mean, in terms of the pandemic, uh, this, this notion of an Im infodemic is really critical. Uh, because it, misinformation spreads like a virus. Uh, and there's actually, you know, some of the work that uh, Sander and I are involved in is this idea of inoculating people against misinformation, again, with that vaccine metaphor. So um, giving people a weakened exposure to the arguments or the ways that people might try and use, misinf uh, present misinformation, so that when they do encounter it in the wild, so to speak, uh, that they, they are able to sort of resist taking it on board as a belief. But um, we, we should have known about this, you know, well, we, we did know about this from the beginning because the WHO warned us about an infodemic right at the start of the pandemic. It was one of the first sort of elements that was raised is we need to be worried about the information or misinformation that circulates. And actually, we knew about it before then because the word infodemic was actually coined during the SARS outbreak in 2002. So it wasn't like it should have been a surprise for anyone. You know, this is something that we knew was coming. So um, I definitely think we could have done more. Chris, can I pick up on something that, that you mentioned? You, you mentioned sort of um, science perhaps being in a better position now as a result of the pandemic. Do you think the public is more science literate than it was beforehand? And, and is that always a good thing if we're improving people's understanding of scientific concepts? I think everyone's got an opinion now. Yeah. Um, uh, on this and everyone's an armchair epidemiologist and everyone's uh, an armchair virologist um, I'm really pleased that people for the first time uh, you know people are beginning to come to me now and saying can I have the reference for that because for years whenever we've made radio programs and I've reported on stories we were very much alone in our reporting when we would say and you can hear or, or read about that written this week in the journal X. And we would always give the reference to, to our coverage. And many other programmes never did that. But I always felt that was really important to try and get across to people, this is how science works. And now I, I think people have really quite switched on to this. Certainly the ones who sort of write to us and say, well, wh where's your justification for that? Where's your evidence? The audience are actually challenging us, saying, we heard this on the programme, where's the, the paper supporting that and that kind of thing. Which, so I think people have become much more kind of cognizant of how science works, how evidence works, and the difference between peer review and just something that someone dreamed up and thought and speculated about. So I think actually the, the public are a lot more clued up, partly because there's been so much science in the, in the media, and, and these things are all being referred to, and, and it's, it's kind of got people all on the same page. So I think it's been, been very good in that respect, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any danger that, because people understand that science, you know, as we were talking about earlier, you, know, you need to give a range of values to express uncertainty because that really is is kind of true scientific fact there's no singular um truth at any moment in time does that make it more difficult sometimes to communicate things to people though if they could immediately say well yes but there is an uncertainty here this isn't an absolute sort of definite fact well i think the way that i've always gone about this and i try to avoid when people say, do you do a sort of mythbuster approach to programmes, I never do that. And the reason I've never done that, while I, I'm not dissing mythbusters, it was a good series and it was fun, <laughs> but in terms of tackling misinformation, you have to be very careful because otherwise people learn the error, not the reality. Because if you say, oh, this is what people say, uh, then they remember that you said that first and they forget why you said it was wrong. And then the myth propagates. So I tend to just take the view that if you give people lots of the correct information and you do it in a fun way and an interesting and engaging way, people will remember it. It's a bit like you throw enough mud at the wall and some will eventually stick. Um, communicating uncertainty, yeah, it's hard. But we, we have approached this by saying to people, we don't know all the answers and we, we do know that we know this to a certain extent. So when we work out an answer, we don't know 100% what the answer is, but we know it must lie somewhere between here and here. And it's a bit like a friend of mine who is in South Africa who discovers ancient human ancestor remains. And he said he hates the phrase, is this the missing link? Because people always ask, then doing a paleoanthropology interview, they always say, is this the missing link? And he said, well, no, because all you've done is turn one big gap into two smaller ones, still gap. 
and it's sort of similar. You're conveying to people, we know this much, but there's a bit of a blurring of the boundary. So we think it's somewhere between here and here, we don't know for sure. And, and I think if you communicate it that way to people, they, they understand why you can't give them a 100% definite answer. And actually, the, 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 the phrase, I don't know, is a very powerful one to use. Because if you say to people, we, we don't know the answer to that, but this is what we think, I think that also helps people to understand that we don't have all the facts, what we have are hypotheses. And do you think that that makes people ultimately trust things that they're told more? Or? Well, I think if you say to people, I don't know the answer to that, then they, I think, can probably appreciate you're not trying to deceive them. Because if you just came up with a whole bunch of flannel and went round the houses, I think people think, this guy's wasting my time. And, well, I would be. But that also, if, if you're honest about what you do know and honest about what you don't know, I think it, it builds more trust. Tushner, um, can I ask, do you think um, there's an issue with trust with people who are from sort of non-white backgrounds because they're, whilst we've seen people sort of depicted in adverts and you showed some of those things on your slide, there maybe wasn't enough representation of people like sort of those hard to reach groups actually talking about COVID sort of in the mainstream media? So. I think, first of all, I, I just want to say it's not all people from ethnically diverse groups. So the issue of trust is prevalent in, in the white communities as well, who are from lower socioeconomic status. If you think about vaccine rates in certain parts of the country, um, it's not only the ethnically diverse groups who are not taking the vaccine and who don't trust the messaging, who don't trust the government. That is not only um, existent and those discourses are not only existent in the ethnically diverse communities. But I think it's trying to understand where that mistrust comes from and what is fueling that mistrust uh, and trying to understand how we, we look at, I, I don't like using the word conspiracy theories, but conspiratorial beliefs because they are changeable. The theory kind of says it is there while we, it's, a, it's a way in which they're making sense of a situation at that particular time. So trust is an issue, You've got but it's not only the ethnic communities that have the issues of mistrust. Mm -hmm. um, if I may just think about a question you, and respond to a question you asked um, Chris earlier about science and the importance of science and has it worked or not worked, and I think you know, yes, this is, you know, in, in, at least in my memory of the last couple of decades, we've not had a situation where government has worked so closely with scientists and, you know, the messaging has come from the expert, the scientists, you know, we, when Boris took to the podium and talked about issues or, or told the country we were going into lockdown and subsequent lockdowns, him being with the chief scientific officer and the chief medical officer was a very powerful message to people. And I think that has, in people's mind, brought that importance of science right to the top. The fact that we had SAGE, which took such a prominent role, um, and that has been really important. It'd be the absence of the scientific advisors when he talked about us coming out and, and all the rules being abandoned is also very clear. It is being recorded, isn't it? I should be <laughs> um, this is quite a big question, uh, but when, if, probably when there is another pandemic at some point in the future, um, what should we be doing differently that we, we, we did this time that maybe wasn't a good thing to have done? John, I feel like you, you, you maybe oh, have some things oh, right. to say on this. But. Some slaps. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I guess the point about misinformation, I mean, if we're really focusing on communication here, I'm not thinking about policy specifically or, or, or you know, the, the, the science. Um, the idea of misinformation and getting out ahead of it, I think there could be a, more work with the tech companies because they were slow to react in the beginning. And, and in fact, it, there are arguments that it wasn't in their best interests to react to the misinformation that was being spread on their networks. It was, it was worth something to them that people were engaging with the content. 
Um, and I think they were very sluggish. And, and, and you know, the, to their credit, they have tried to make some changes now, but it could have been done a lot faster. And I think that from the get-go next time that we see this happening, when, when the next pandemic happens, uh, there, there should be a faster reaction to, to move to prevent the spread of harmful misinformation as quickly as possible. That would be one of, at the top of my list. Chris, what do you think? I think you have to ask the question, why did this happen? Now, when this first happened, I went and got the lectures that I've been giving for the University of Cambridge medics and vets and natural science students for about 10 years. And I did Emerging Infections 1 and Emerging Infections 2. Exciting stuff, this, isn't it? Imaginative title. But the answer is, it, it does what it says on the tin. This was an analysis of why do new diseases come about and where do they come from? And 75% of the time, these emerging infections are what are called zoonoses. They're infections that jump out of nature and cross the species barrier and get into us humans. And I looked at what I'd taught in those lectures and the number one example I gave was SARS, which was the 2003 precursor to what we're now seeing. And then I had Ebola in there, and I had things like dengue, and all these things have come to pass. And the mechanism I was putting forward for why this happens is something changes in the virus or the bacterium or the bug, something changes in the environment, or something changes in the host, i.e. us, or the animal that covers, carries it at the time. Or usually it's a combination of all those things. But uniting all of them is that we end up too close to nature. Because if you look at all the examples of where this has happened, there are interactions between humans where they shouldn't be brushing up against animals that were doing their thing, and it enabled whatever the bug was to jump the species barrier. Now, the driver that brings us into conflict with nature is that there are, unfortunately, too many of us. And when I first made my first radio programme, I remember walking into a studio in 2000... It was 1999. I walked into a radio studio, some of the first radio programmes I made, and I had a copy of New Scientist. And on the cover, it said, today, the six billionth person was born on Earth. Now, obviously, they didn't know that the six billionth person was born that day. But there were about six billion humans on Earth at that time. And if I did that same thing today, that number would say eight billion so in the two decades that I've been making science programmes, we have increased the population of humans on Earth by 30%, at least. And that means that you've got huge amounts of pressure being applied to the environment, and you super-add to that the effects of climate change, and you see people increasingly in conflict with nature, and that is increasing the likelihood of these sorts of jumps occurring. And it is not a coincidence that in the time that I've been a virologist which I started doing in 2003, we've had SARS, then we had a swine flu pandemic, then we had the Ebola pandemic, then we had the Zika potential pandemic, and now we've got this. And it's accelerating. The frequency of which this is happening is accelerating as the human race continues to overpopulate the planet. And it's an uncomfortable concept to consider and grapple with, but it never gets discussed because people are uncomfortable discussing it. But it is the driver. Human population. If you look where the population explosions have happened, that's where the pandemics happened. And we need a plan for sustainable existence in the future. If we want to safeguard the next time, we need a plan to not do what we've done wrong every time since, which is bring us into conflict with nature. And that, that is at the key, that otherwise we're always going to be fighting fire rather than preventing fires. And we, and we need to talk to people about that and explain it to have people. have the conversation. People don't like having it, and the shutters come down straight away, certainly in some countries, some cultures, but it is an unfortunate reality. And if we don't confront it, the human population is growing at 1% per year on average. In some countries, it's growing at 10%, some 20% per year. Now, a 1% population growth rate, uh, you're the mathematician, um, <laughs> you, can, you can actually do the compound interest formula, which is you 101 over 100 to the power of x equals two, right? So you can work out, how long do I have to go before I've doubled something? What value of x? Well, the answer is about 75 years. So if we go for the average lifetime of the person, of the average person in this room, there will be double as many of us on Earth as there are now, at the current rate of growth, 1% per year. And we're already totally outstripping the planet of resources. And that is if we just carry on business as usual. 
in some places on Earth, it's going far faster. And those are often the places where a lot of these exotic diseases exist. And if we do not take this seriously and do not confront this and have a plan to make sure that we live within our means, then we're, we're in big trouble. Tushna, is there anything... <laughs> Is there anything you'd want to see done differently here in the UK? I think we've got to talk about the elephant in the room, health inequalities as well. You know, we in England, we had a huge number of deaths. We, we went into lockdown quickly. We put in loads of mechanisms to try and make sure we, we didn't have such high rates of mortality. And was, if you look at globally, given our population, we had quite, we didn't look very good, did we? And it's, it's really thinking back on if we do want to prepare ourselves for future crises, we've got to think about the most vulnerable, the most deprived, uh, and that includes some ethnic communities, but not only the ethnically diverse communities. We've got to think about you know, housing, we've got to think about air quality, the areas they live in. We, we do need to think about all those various issues. We need to think about trust in institutions, trust in the NHS, uh, making sure they don't de de delay going in for treatments, but also making sure that economically they are safeguarded. In so many ways, the furlough sc schemes, etc., didn't protect the most vulnerable they could not afford to test it wasn't a reluctance to test it was an inability to isolate that was preventing them and i think the sooner we really start thinking about vulnerable and the harder to reach we will be better prepared for whether whichever pandemic or other crisis that comes our way um i wonder if we Maybe are now at a point where we should start taking some questions from the audience. Um, I can already see a gentleman up here with his hand up. Um, so if you have a question, um, please don't be shy. Um, if you just raise your hand, someone will come around with a microphone um, and then you can ask our panel. I was just going to start from a question we've had from Slido from our audience watching online just as we, we move the microphones around. And is, uh, is there data evidence showing whether public behaviour changed? after high-profile examples of people ignoring, bending the rules? So we'll, we'll start with that, and then we'll come into the audience here. I think this is probably a reference to what was going on in Downing Street, isn't it? Or uh, as the uh, Sun newspaper and a couple of other reported it, uh, Downing 10 Street. Uh, um, certainly, people do follow, by, follow people's examples, and we lead by example. And if people see other people ignoring guidance, then they're going to too. But the thing is that when you set this guidance, you don't set it expecting everybody to 100% of the time toe the line. What you expect is that most people will do most of the things most of the time, and that will mean that most of the time you're going in mostly the right direction. It's a bit like, hands up here if you've never broken the speed limit on the road. <laughs> hands up here if you drive a car. Uh, this is being recorded, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Yes, y you've got that, have you? Good, okay, fine. Yes, they're waiting for you outside. In other words, we set speed limits because speed limits save lives. But we also accept that not everybody complies with them all the time, but if most people drive at about 30 miles an hour in about a 30 mile an hour zone, then most of the time that will translate into fewer accidents. And if, you, on the other hand, everybody breaks the limit all the time, people will all break the speed limit all the time and there will be more accidents. So it's, it's all about people try, trying to do mostly what's right. And, and I think that people did see some people not towing the line and I think that did lead some people astray. Equally, you can very quickly pull the rug from under everyone's motivation to do the right thing if you do things like pursue walkers in the Lake District or Derbyshire with drones and then arrest two women out having a cup of coffee with each other, which was absolutely ridiculous. Um, and so you have to have measures that I think people trust and see why they're worth having. So when you shut the aisle in Wales that sells duvets in the supermarket or accidentally block off the aisle that's got feminine hygiene products in it because they're not critical during a pandemic, of course, um, people then quite quickly think this is bullshit and, and they, they tend to 
walk away from, and they tend to break other rules as well. So I think you, you have to be very careful what you decide to regulate and how you implement it and, and make sure people understand why you're doing what you're doing and only do it for as long as is necessary. Nicola Sturgeon has, has been very, very forceful with various measures in Scotland and people are now beginning to say, hang on a minute, we've got all these extra measures in Scotland and the rates in Scotland are higher of COVID cases than they are in England. Can you explain that? And then she changes the subject. You don't want the microphone, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can, I can add a, a, a sort of extra comment to that, which is with, with taking the example of Dominic Cummings. And people say, well, you know, if you see these high-profile elites breaking the rules, then people are going to, you know, potentially think it's okay to do. But I think in that particular example, and this is, this is nothing to do with my work, but I've, people have um, presented the argument that actually seeing the way the media treated Dominic Cummings in the wake of that meant that people who maybe were thinking of breaking the rules looked around and thought, well, everyone's really mad at that guy. Um, I don't want to be in the same position as him. And so there is an argument that actually a lot of people adhered more to the rules after they saw the public backlash that he got. Um, now, I can't speak to too much detail about that. that, that I, I don't have an insight into the data, as the question was asking. Um, but it certainly makes sense in terms of how we look to others around us for guidance on behaviour. And sure, you see someone breaking the rules, but you see everyone else piling in on him, and you think, I don't want to be him. And so there is an argument that in that particular case, it might have actually had a positive effect on, on behaviour. So we maybe need a useful scapegoat. <laughs> <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it as a strategy. Let's put it that way. Uh, yes, the gentleman up here. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, I'm three quarters of a century old and I'm like a pincushion. I've had so many jabs, it's unbelievable over my lifetime. Is there any, any data um, about um, the, the different take-ups of other jabs over lifetimes so that we can relate the fact that some people are anti-jabs. Maybe they never have one. I mean, I've you know, known people, uh, I had a West Indian girlfriend, she was probably Windrush for all I know, um, and she'd never had a jab. Um, and I, have you know, <laughs> from when I started secondary school, all the time they were sticking things in you. And every year they stick a jab in me for, um, you know what it is, and I can't remember because I've, <laughs> lost my memory. What is it they give you a jab for every year? Flu. flu. Yeah, flu jabs. I mean, memory I don't loss. even know whether more people have died of flu than COVID. It wouldn't surprise me. I've no idea. The problem with COVID is it's extremely fast and we haven't got a big enough system to deal with it because we won't pay for it. If you pay for an NHS that's got the capacity, you don't have to panic so much about... Um, <laughs> about things that spread quickly. Yeah. Otherwise, we do, and there wasn't enough room. Anyway, I mean, really, I'd like to know how many pincushions there are. <laughs> so do we know the differences in uptake across different groups in the country? So I think the latest, when we, I think it's 57% of the population, and, you know, I, I, I'm just speaking from memory. I, could, I need to double-check. But 57% of the population that's vaccinated. And if we're looking at revaccination rates, there are very few people coming in for first and second jabs at the moment. So most people who are going in and having jabs are ones who've already had it before. I mean, taking your question on, you know, not only thinking about COVID jabs, but looking at whether some people just have never had jabs. Um, indeed, the work we do with uh, undocumented migrants and other migrant groups coming in, we do find that their childhood vaccine rates are often missing or, or undocumented. You don't, they don't know it. And there's no straightforward system in which we as a country can make sure they have a catch-up screening, a catch-up vaccine program outside the NHS, and many of them think of the NHS uh, as a gatekeeping system. Um, so for the harder to reach migrant communities, very much presenting at the NHS is that fear that they could be reported to the Home Office, etc. So if we are thinking about catch-up vaccine programs beyond COVID, 
uh, and making sure that, that that ethos of having jobs and we try and build that trust that it is okay to have a job in communities that have not been vaccinated, we've got to take it to their communities. And again, you know, you've got amazing uh, initiatives, Doctors of the World, the work they've been doing on COVID buses with, with COVID, but also other catch-up programs have been amazing initiatives where you're taking away that gatekeeper of having it within the NHS and its trusted sources that are providing the service. Did you want to add? Sorry, just quickly, the issue is if I had um, never had a jab, I would have really thought about it. I'd have spent so long thinking about it, I probably wouldn't have gotten one. But because I've always had these things, I just wandered in there, you know, you know it's like, yeah, would you like a sandwich? <laughs> It's quite funny, when I went for mine, um, I discovered when I uh, got to the front of the queue, they all recognised me off the telly and they were all drawing lots backstage, who was going to shoot up the dock? <laughs> but we've had really high uptake in this country and about 99% of the population now have antibodies, 91% of the population antibodies because they have actually had at least one dose of the vaccine. The adult population, really high uptake, much higher than we've had with any other vaccine campaign ever, actually. And if we use flu as an index or a benchmark, in Addenbrooke's hospital, we've got one of the highest uptakes of flu vaccines amongst our staff. And we get about an 80% uptake of flu vaccines in an average year among our staff now, which is really high. In some parts of the country, it's lower than 50%. And on average, it's about 50 or 60% of people when offered the jab for, say, flu, take it. So it's, I think, a range of factors. One of them is that there is a bit of distrust, and some people are, are just distrustful. Some feel that it's an admission of weakness, because if you admit you need a flu jab, you're kind of admitting that age might be getting the better of you or that, you know, you're not quite as robust as you thought you were. And so actually you tend to use your track record. Well, I haven't died of flu yet. I've made it to 75. I must be all right. So I don't need one now. And there's, there's an element of that too. And also there's an element of busyness. Some people are just really bloody busy and they've got better things to do than traipse off down to the chemist. In other cases, it's cost because people have to pay for it. In other cases, it's a day off work or time off work and people would therefore end up paying for it. So there's a range of factors which if we want to get people to, up, to uptake you know, more medicines and vaccines and so on, you have to remove those obstacles. And so that's what they're trying to do with things like the flu jab at Adam Brooks. Take the jabs to the people who need them. Highlight the fact that you need them to the people and then make it very difficult for people to say no because you've removed all, all of the reasons why they might say, well, actually, I haven't got time or I can't afford it or whatever. You say, well, it's here. Do you want it? Absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, I was interested in what you said about um, communicating uncertainty and being clear about the uncertainty. And I just wondered if you had any tips. I'm a GP, so you have somebody in front of you who's, say, pregnant, and they say, um, shall I have the jab? And, uh, you know, you say, well, I think it's a really good thing. And they say, well, what's the evidence? And you say, oh, well, I don't really know, or I can't give you all the answers. So that's quite tricky when you're actually in a one-to-one -one situation and another one would be you know this variant is it milder than than the ones we've had before and how do we know we're not going to have a nasty variant and you give them a bit of a spiel about the likelihood but just wondered if you've got any tips about when you're in that one-to-one -one scenario how you you say you shouldn't persuade people you try to inform them so that they make the choice that you want them to make yeah so uh, I mean, in, in, a, in a medical setting, there's a, there is a mandate for informed consent, right? Like, you're actually legally obliged to make sure that someone's informed. Um, so communicating that uncertainty, I mean, I'm thinking really about uncertainty in the evidence itself. And you might say, well, look, we're not sure exactly um, the level of protection you get. But there would be data, I mean, and this comes to the, the evidence element, there would be data that, that gives a range, right? So when we talk about the vaccine efficacy rates, often they're talked about as a singular number, but there is a range there, and it's important to say, well, actually, you know, 
it could be between these values, if I'm being honest, but we know it's above zero, right? It's, 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 it gives some level of protection. We can't say exactly what percentage of, of you know, um, efficacy it is. Uh, but, but perhaps more importantly, and this comes to the balance element I was talking about, is, is to be clear about you know, the benefits of being vaccinated and also you know, what's on the other side of that. Like, what if I'm not vaccinated? Um, what are the potential consequences in, in, in that decision situation? Um, and so one thing the Winton Centre did, which was um, working with the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation around the AstraZeneca risk, and talking about the risks of the vaccine, which is very uncomfortable. No one wanted to talk about the risks, but there was a, a, a very small risk there um, to do with a particular kind of blood clot. And we worked, well, my colleagues worked with them in developing um, some infographics that, that communicated this risk visually, but also talked about what the benefits of vaccination were, or, or more, more realistically, the, the risks of catching COVID compared to the risks of, of the vaccine. And that idea of the balance was really important for saying, you know, there's context here. Yes, there is a small risk, but don't just focus on that. Think about the risks of not being vaccinated as well. But um, I, I don't know if that gets quite to the core of your question about the uncertainty itself. I found if I gave people an example of something they were familiar with to introduce the unfamiliar, it was more relatable. And actually, I got the idea from Jenny Harris, who now runs UKHSA, because when they were trying to reassure people, it backfired a bit, actually, but when they were trying to reassure people about going to school, it's safe, she said, look, quite frankly, this is at a Downing Street press briefing, right? Enormous audience. Quite frankly, you're more likely to have a fatal run-in with your school bus than you are with coronavirus. But the point was valid, because actually the risk of getting hit by and killed by the school bus is about one in a million. We have that statistic. You must know. You must have this as an existential risk, being a death by school bus running over. But um, that was about the same risk profile for young children catching coronavirus. Unfortunately, it came back to bite them because when they then said, now we want children to get vaccinated against coronavirus, people turned around and said, hang on a minute, you told me I actually had a one in a million chance of having a problem with that. But the, the, the principle is sound, which if you give people an example of something to which they can relate, being hit by lightning, most people realise that's about a one in a million chance. And so if you say to people, are you worried about being hit by lightning today? when you came to my surgery, and they said, well, no, not at all, didn't give them another thought. Well, then you don't need to worry about this vaccine then. And then they can relate one with the other. Whereas if you say to people, you have a 0.001% chance, of people think, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. But when they've got something to, to sort of relate it to, it does make it a little bit more tractable. And, and I found that was very useful for helping people to, to get some sense of perspective about the relative risks of different threats. Yeah, I think that was useful. I think the pregnancy was a tricky one because there's a sort of belief that in the past we had avoided giving pregnant women vaccines. And so it was a difficult belief thing. Um, um, although we were able to say to people, uh, if you catch coronavirus, your risk of all of these risks of pregnancy and all of the risks of, for a newborn are all amplified far more than the risks we have from a vaccine. And we've now got hundreds of thousands of people who've been pregnant, been vaccinated and had healthy babies or whatever. But again, that was also a bit of a backfire moment because initially at those Downing Street press briefings, when they announced the measures that were coming in, it was if you are pregnant, you should shield. You should regard yourself as extremely vulnerable. When the vaccines come out, if you're pregnant, you should not have these vaccines. And the message that was planted was this is dangerous for pregnant women. Yeah. Actually, the message should have been because we haven't yet collected evidence of safe use, we're advising people to wait. That would have been the better way to convey it because then people can understand that actually it was a data gathering thing and it was an absence of evidence of safety, not an absence of evidence of danger, which was motivating that decision. I think the issue of pregnant women and vaccines or any treatments is, is, is really interesting because we've had such a paternalistic attitude towards the way we treat pregnant women in medicine generally. Uh, you know, the drugs you can take when you're pregnant, the vaccines you can take, not only COVID vaccines, but other vaccines, whooping cough vaccines. Do we, pregnant women are hesitant towards quite a lot of these treatments and vaccines and that's partly the way in which the medical professionals think about the pregnant woman. I think going back to that changing advice about pregnant women having to shield and not take the vaccine at the start of the pandemic and then moving on to 
you must take it because it's safe for you and the unborn child. It's acknowledging again that that trajectory and what we know with the evidence has changed. And I think, again, the Royal Colleges did a fantastic job there on really pushing those messages and that changed messaging um, and endorsing the vaccines, etc. And I think those are really important. Uh, but also the point that John made on you know, the balance, it's, it's about risk. You know, the 1%, 2% means nothing to people in general, but saying the risk of X happening and Y happening and thinking about different scenarios is really helpful when people make decisions. I think we'll go over here next and then we'll, we'll head over there. Thanks very much. Uh, the Discussion so far has been very much focused on how the public receives information about uh, about COVID and how uh, they can be informed uh, better. Uh, my question is more about the employers um, and the duty of care that they have for uh, for the, the people uh, across the country, and um, particularly looking at the private sector as well. Um, in the pandemic, and it's got clearer and, and more streamlined recently, um, but in the midst of the pandemic, and particularly after when there was a return to work, there was like a labyrinth of rules and each employer had a different set of mandates about how many people could be in the office, how many could work from home. Um, airlines were similar, similarly impacted and had you know, a PhD worth of, of details about uh, how to travel. Do you think that there's a different approach that's needed to engage employers and particularly the, the private sector, which have more of a remit over their specific uh, groups of employees, about how to convey um, the impact that COVID can have, but also the way to incorporate the knowledge of, of science to advise how they would uh, treat their employees um, moving forward? Come in mind. <laughs> Initially, people were just trying t to be cautious because they didn't know really. We, di we didn't even know that this virus was transmissible before a person even had symptoms. And that was really what caught people out because most of the infectious diseases we deal with, when a person's symptomatic, that's when they're infectious. And so we took the same approach initially with this and were really rather surprised when we found that people are most infectious before they have any symptoms at all. So that's had to sort of be factored in. So people have really had to feel their way through this. And a lot of the stuff that was pushed out there and a lot of the things people obsessively did really achieve bucker all, to be perfectly honest with you. All this obsessive hand washing just gave people eczema because this is a respiratory infection. Coronavirus is spread via the respiratory route. And yes, if you scooped up a whole blob of snot that someone's left on the table and you rubbed it in your eye, you'll probably get coronavirus infection. But most people don't do that. Most people breathe. And so as a result, most of the time, you're just packing people into these offices or train carriages or lifts, you know, all these different things which we've got used to tolerating. We don't like it, but we've got used to tolerating it because that's how it is. And the, these viruses have evolved to exploit that. Respiratory infections, I guarantee, even despite the best efforts of lockdown, everyone in this room had at least one cold in the last couple of years, right? Bet you all did, didn't you? Fewer, but I bet you've all had at least one cold. That is testimony to how good these viruses are, despite our best efforts of continuing to transmit and spread through the population. And they go via the one thing we cannot avoid doing, which is breathing. And they all settle on your face, settle up your nose, settle in your throat. So the thing that's really focusing minds now is about actually making offices better places to exist in. Because over air conditioning, a packed space so that you can pack in as many people as possible and save yourself a few quid on bench space, that really has, has, has occurred to people that that's a thing of the past. And I, I think that going forward, we are going to see people making workspaces better ventilated, better supportive, better environments for people to work in. And I think employers will realise that actually that translates into happier workers and more productive workers. Because if you look at how many days are lost every year through ill health when there's not a pandemic, it's millions of working days per year are lost. Where do most of those infections come from? Probably from something you caught at work, on the way to work or on the way home from work.
Do you remember those adverts where it, it had this geezer who looked like he was death warmed up, would reach for this packet, I won't mention the brand, and it would say something like, sorts the men from the boys, and it would, he would sort of swallow a couple of pills, and then he'd be full of the joys of spring and back in the office. Well, they're not going to cure a virus, are they? They're just going to make him feel better and fully infectious. So he'll just go to work and then give it to everyone else, and then they'll be buying Lemsip the next day. So I think that our mindset has changed around how we work, where we work, and how we make people work. And I think people are a bit more conscious now about how these things spread. And if you do feel ill, maybe not come to work that day because your colleagues won't thank you for it. We've all become a bit more cognizant of that. And, and also I think employers have become a little bit more supportive of this whole idea about what we dub shirking from home, you know, working from home. Uh, and so I, I think that the whole ethos of work will change a bit and, and people will relax. We will get back to normal more normal. It won't, I don't think, go back all the way it was before. I think many of these things will, will these changes will be implemented, but I think we will, we will relax away from a lot of these things that were knee-jerk reactions. When, when you see, I saw someone the other day at the hospital, I was working, walking around Adam Brooks, and there was this bloke walking around in the concourse, and I thought, is he about to do some gardening? Because he had a strimming, you know, he had his strimmer mask on. Uh, that is not going to do anything, because he's presumably breathing behind his strimming mask, his gardening, because otherwise he'd be dead. So therefore, all the air he's breathing in is going up the inside of the mask and up his nose. When he breathes out, well, he's not in a cocoon, is he? So all the virus he's breathing out is coming out the bottom of the mask and all over the air around him. That sort of knee-jerk being seen to do something which actually does nothing, that will go. And, and I think there will be a few things that we will cling on to that, that do improve the odds for things and, and protect employers from legislation and litigation. Yes, this lady here. The mic's just coming around. Thanks. I wondered if we could just do some reflections a bit more internationally, if that's possible. So, firstly, it would be helpful to understand if, um, to the extent you're involved in those communications, whether there were lessons drawn from overseas and what other countries were doing. Uh, what they were, and then has there been reflections since that time? I'm thinking particularly countries like New Zealand, Kia ora. <laughs> and um, my understanding is that, you know, there was very early on kind of an involvement of a whole nation, a team, but also that um, Dr Ashley Bloomfield was, was noting, you know, media was reporting perhaps potential outbreaks, and that was being taken on board by the health department and looked into. So it was a two-way street, not a one-way street. Um, but I'd really like to hear about, you know, international experience drawing on real time, but also kind of the lessons learned now. Is that being undertaken? Thank you. I mean, so I'm biased because <laughs> I come from New Zealand. But I mean, I looked on with a sense of jealousy, like at my, my friends and family back home who were just able to move around freely, right, because they closed the borders very early on and uh, after a very short lockdown had essentially no restrictions. Um, and so that is seen as a bit of a success story, and they did have things going for them, like uh, being an island where they could close the borders and being a relatively small country. But that said, I mean, they still did a lot of things well. So um, the way that they talked about their restrictions and the guidelines that they were putting forward were very clear, and that can be juxtaposed with what happened here in the UK with the discussion of the, the different levels that I don't know if people can remember when there used to be levels and it wasn't clear what they meant. And then there's also a tier system alongside that which wasn't related. And it, it, it was very difficult to understand. And New Zealand took a very focused and singular approach where they clearly laid out the justifications for the different restrictions and so on. And they also had this element of uncertainty where they said, look, these may change because we're still learning about the virus. Um, so certainly, and you know, there is a, a lot of discussion about what could be learned from that particular example. But there are other countries that did well as well, um, Singapore in, in the early stages. Um, so certainly I think the next time around there will be guidance taken from, from the things that they did well there and also the things that didn't work well in other countries. And of course, I mean, because of me coming from New Zealand, I've, I've focused a lot on, on the work they did there. Um, but certainly, and from a psychological perspective, one of the things they emphasised really well was a collective identity talking about the team of five million, which was, um, you know, we're all in this together and it's about protecting each other uh, as, as a group rather than any kind of p 
political divisions being coming into it or anything like that. So that certainly was um, a positive aspect of it, and it's been you know, widely held up as a good example of using that kind of approach. But the others may have other, other, other contexts internationally that they, they want to talk about. So thinking about third world countries and lesser developed countries, um, what really springs to mind is how we named viruses at the start of the pandemic, the Chinese variant, the Indian variant. Of course, by the time it had got to Africa, you know, we had directives that we couldn't use those terms anymore. Um, but I think rather than think about the communications that work, if I may focus on the fact that vaccines aren't available in some of these countries, and really that discrepancy of we are at that position where we're offering vaccines for people who are vulnerable and we're having their fourth and fifth vaccines while in some parts of the country, uh, sorry, the world, that people haven't had their first vaccine who work in settings um, which make them very vulnerable and susceptible to the virus. So if there are lessons on equity and thinking about communications that we are a global world and, and viruses spread globally, it wasn't feasible. And with every virus, we can't lock down countries and close borders. We are... A, a, a global society, how are we going to globally protect countries and really think about some of those very pertinent issues? So, I think uh, this gentleman here has a question. Um, when you're thinking about how well science communication did during the uh, COVID pandemic, um, guessing quite a lot of that has to do with what people's opinion was about science before the pandemic. You know, there'd been a lot, uh, I forgot, was it Michael Gove who said we British public's had enough of experts? I forget the exact quote. I, I think there was some distrust in, you know, experts in general and scientists in particular. And I'm wondering if, I might be too optimistic, but could a legacy be that, you know, to prepare for the next pandemic when it comes, one of the things we need to do is just get science communication and trust better um, in general. So, you know, hopefully have less of a problem when the next one comes along. I think, Michael, I think, I think, um, I think this is going flat. <laughs> <laughs> Because the <laughs> uh, I think Michael Gove also said um, he wanted 70% of students at school to be above average, wasn't it? That was, I think it was also him who said that. Um, well, obviously, as someone who does a lot of science communication, I'm a bit biased, aren't I? But this has shown us all we need to know, really, that... that, that actually there's a huge demand for this science rules our lives and whether it's the phone in your pocket to the smart speaker in your kitchen that's eavesdropping on your every word to uh, facebook which is profiling or meta which is profiling you and then flogging you adverts for things it's you know an increasingly tech dominated world we live in and when you live in that world you intuitively want to know more about it and are introduced to more aspects of science and medicine and technology everyone lives in a human body and would like their body to work as well as possible so i think people are intuitively very interested and i think there is a lot of interest in in the world around us but the, there was a perception in the media for a really long time that science is dull science is boring and we should just uh, keep that to the sidelines and let people focus on what they're really interested in, which is um, celebrities. So, I mean, they're right, aren't they? I mean, ab ab absolutely, I mean, much more important. Um, but what this has shown us is that there are some people who are quite good at science and also quite good at speaking, and they can say interesting things that people want to hear. And I think that has helped broadcasters to accept that you know, the, these stories matter too. But you will always be fighting a news agenda when you, when you make programmes and so on. People, people will, when they're building programmes, they will be asking, what is my top story? 
what, what, what's the thing that really matters, what's got to go at the top of the news. COVID has hogged the headlines for two years, but then just look how quickly it sidelined to what was going on in Ukraine. I mean, it's very important to report what's going on in Ukraine, but what that's done is to, in the public consciousness, that has translated into COVID's gone away. And actually what's happened is in the background, there's this enormous peak of, of cases. I mean, we're probably we're looking at millions of cases in this country. We were detecting until recently about one in every two cases of, of coronavirus infection in the country we were picking up. And why, why only one in two? Well, about half the time, even before Omicron came along and was much milder, about half of the time it was asymptomatic in people. So we were therefore, if we were having testing, predicated on have you got symptoms you're going to miss one in two cases well now we're not really doing that but equally people's motivation to to test and the consequences of if you think i can't i really can't be asked to test some people think i don't want i don't want the consequences of that we think we're now detecting about one in eight to ten cases so you take the number which you see reported as the probable daily rate and you times that by ten and in other words, the iceberg has sunk a little bit lower in the water, or actually, in this case, quite a lot lower in the water. There's a huge clinical iceberg of what you see above the waterline. That's the cases we know about. What's under the water is, is the real burden of disease in, in the community. It's absolutely huge. So I think, to go back to your point, that this has galvanised public interest. It certainly has, but it, it will move on, and it will be sidelined again. There will be a new news agenda People are sick and tired of they've had COVID dose and now they just want some COVID respite. It's making sure that, that I think we do keep, keep the opportunities for, for science stories to maintain their presence in the media because they're important. I mean, I'd, I'd add to that that the, the idea of the, the UK public has had enough of experts is probably an over-exaggeration. There wasn't a sort of rife vein of anti-intellectualism in the UK. There is an element of that in the US where you see, especially, especially with a kind of political element, but um, certainly here I don't think that, that there was a, a widespread distrust of science and medicine before the pandemic. But it actually, I mean, in, in all the kinds of surveys that look at this, scientists and doctors are at the top of the, the professions that are kind of trusted by the public. Um, and when the pandemic hit, that actually went up. So in the very early stages, and we collected at the Winton Centre survey data over several months looking at this pattern, there was a bump right at the beginning of the pandemic where people would try put even more trust on average in doctors and scientists. Um, and that's sort of come down a little bit over time now and it's back sort of to almost baseline levels. Um, but it, it indicates that it's, it's, it's consistently high. And um, I know that people talk about how do we build trust or how do we shore up trust. And from a science communication kind of perspective, I think it's better to think about how can science scientists be more trustworthy, right? And so placing this kind of onus on like, how do we, not, how do we get trust from our audience, but how do we demonstrate that we're trustworthy? And, and whether they trust us or not, is that's up to them. We're not trying to take trick them because you could lie to people to get you to trust them right um, but how do we how do we act in a way that shows that we're worth trusting and I think that's a that's a good way to frame the thinking around you know when we come to to talking to public audiences uh, how can we do so in a way that that shows that we're trying to be impartial that we're treating them with respect and so on our microphone's working again <laughs> Great. we've got time for one more question so my colleague's just going to bring it across thank you Thank you. Uh, I posted this online as well, so I'm glad it hasn't been asked twice. Um, this goes back to, uh, it's a question about Tushner's last slide where you had your diagram with the kind of flow that led to behaviours at the end, which was really interesting because what struck me is you could probably apply that kind of model to lots of behaviours where you're trying to get people to do something that will protect them or protect other people. And the bit that like some of it is kind of easy, like the measuring identity alignment, that's kind of, you get that, that makes sense. The next part where you talked about the sense-making response and you're either in the receptive group or the alternative group, that's the bit where I thought, well, how, do you, how does that work? Like, is there something that shapes that and that sort of shapes, well, how do I see myself and how do I put myself into a group and then how do I respond really in the moment that matters? 
it's, it's what you mentioned, the identity alignment. To what extent do I see that messaging from people um, are based on the way people around me and myself think? And I think specifically for ethnic communities, I think it's important to realize it's about the social identity rather than the... So the we is far more important than the I. So it's making sure that the messaging really addresses that, the way in which they see themselves. And when with COVID as that disruption, it, it changed so much for them. The sense of blame from people, no one has COVID but the ethnic community is the first slide I put on that consistent representation that actually ethnic communities are um, disproportionately represented was not helpful. And that sense-making was taking place, not in isolation, but very much under that those conditions, if I may. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question. I think it is complex. Thank you. No, it's, it's, it's a really, I mean, it's a useful model. Thank you. I hope it gets published. <laughs> Journal editors. Well, um, I think that's all we've got time for. But I'd just like to say a very big thank you um, to our three panellists who I think have been very excellent. I hope uh, you've enjoyed uh, listening to them today and we could give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also just like to say thank you for some, some really excellent questions as well um, and I hope you all get to enjoy um, some other bits of the Cambridge Festival.